Today I took my last antidepressant pill. It looked a little bit like this. And it was the last of over two and a half years of consistent use of this, sertraline. This is hopefully the last time that I'll have to come off them. Though it may well not be the case. And it may well be the case that some other time I'll have to go back on them and then eventually I'll come off again. And that might be the cycle of my entire life. But I'm hoping this will be the last time because I think I finally developed habits and developed practices which help me to clear myself of uh, the things that make me depressed. Now, I know what you might be thinking. You might be thinking depression is an immutable condition, is an illness which you yourself can't change, and is something which you don't necessarily have any control over. And whilst that is to an extent true, it's also only true to an extent. Now, I think that that kind of narrative has been extremely useful for people in getting their condition taken seriously, in being able to say, no, this is not just something where I can think myself happy or I can go out and do a bit of exercise and everything's gonna be okay. And consequently, that means we're now in a position where people are able to say, I am depressed, I have depression, I am a depressed person, and they're taken seriously to an extent. Obviously, there are enormous issues with mental health uh, treatment and diagnosis, um, particularly ones which pertain to anything other than depression in you know, white middle-class men. With that said, I do think that this narrative has its limits because essentially it says that if you are depressed or you're anxious or you have any kind of mental illness or mental condition or neurodivergence, there's really not all that much you can do about it. And I think the argument I make is that to some extent we've gone too far in the other direction in saying that you have essentially no control over your thoughts, your feelings, and your behaviours. It's the we can't all be neurotypical Karen slogan, which essentially means that we tell ourselves that this is just something which we have to deal with, uh, and we tell other people um, that if they're trying to prescribe things to us, then they probably don't understand what we're going through, um, and they therefore ought not necessarily to be listened to. Now, I think that might be, to coin a phrase, problematic, because the things that have helped me get past my depression are things which are essentially just changes in habits. So I've changed the way in which I sleep, I've changed the way in which I exercise, I've changed the foods I consume, I've changed my attitude towards myself and my environment, I've changed the kinds of media that I consume. And these are all changes which, yes, on their own, are not going to get rid of it. And I'm not saying that it's something which is purely within your control. Rather, I think that it is possible to change your environment and change yourself in such a way that it becomes less likely that your mental health condition takes over your life. I think this is particularly important given the current socioeconomic context in which we live. It's one in which, in the UK at least, governments have consistently slashed funding towards mental health services whilst amping up the rhetoric which essentially says that mental health conditions can all be solved as long as you talk to someone. It's the just talk strategy. So the consequence of that is that there are in ever increasing numbers of people who are willing to talk to their friends, their family, their community, the people around them, their loved ones, about their mental health conditions, but there is an ever dwindling amount of actually decent support on offer. The consequence of that is that if you go to your GP, the likelihood is that they will simply diagnose you with depression and then they will give you an SSRI. It might be fluoxetine, it might be citalopram, it might be sertraline, they might even give you an SNRI, like venlafaxin. But the short of it is that you're basically going to get given a drug, told to go away, and then hopefully you'll get better with that drug. It is highly unlikely that you'll be able to access counselling particularly easily. It's even more unlikely that you'll be able to be referred to a psychiatrist unless you know precisely what you're looking for and are able to push your GP in a way that allows you to steer them without them necessarily knowing that they're being steered because essentially you have 10 minutes to make your case at your GP and then from there they'll decide whether you are just someone who can be written off as depressed or anxious and given a beta blocker or an antidepressant or whether you're someone who genuinely needs more serious help. The consequence of that, even further, is that people with significant neurodivergences like ADHD or in some instances even, even autism or other really complex 
mental health conditions or neurodivergences, not to conflate the two, are left in a position where they're basically diagnosed with depression, anxiety, sometimes even bipolar disorder, and that's the end of it. They are never really given the opportunity to actually explore what it means to have the condition that they actually have. So then finally, we're in a position where essentially you're told to talk to your friends or your family. You do that. They tell you that you need to go to the doctor. You do that. They send you away with some drugs. You take the drugs. They might work for you, they might not. It's highly unlikely that the drugs alone work for you because essentially for most of the drugs that we have, the proven efficacy rate is something which is ameliorative rather than completely effective. And so consequently, you're left in this position where you have medicalized your depression or your anxiety or whatever mental health condition you have and you don't see any other way of being able to get out of it because you've been told that it's a disease and should be treated as a disease rather than something which can be treated um, in the same way that you might treat any other problem in your life. That is something which can be overcome with some degree of willpower and behavior changes. Now, I think that's a problem not just because of the way in which the attitude stultifies us into inaction and says there's nothing that can be really done about your condition. Rather, I think it's a problem because that is not how we treat physical illness either. If you have a broken leg or a cold or the flu or really any other kind of condition, maybe something like an autoimmune condition, you would change the way in which you behave in order to try and get better. You would have bed rest, you might engage in rehabilitation, you might make sure you get enough sleep, but you also might make sure that you, uh, for example, change your nutritional regime if you've got an autoimmune disease so you're not consuming quite so much processed nonsense and therefore you're able to change the amount of inflammation in your body. Now we're learning more all the time about the way in which the body and the mind are linked and the ways in which what we consume and what we do influences what goes on inside our brains. And so I don't think it's a stretch to say that if you engage in some kind of exercise, if you make sure that you uh, get out of bed, that you have someone who can get you out of bed, that you have some kind of deadlines to adhere to, that you have food that you're eating, which is not just Oreos and, I don't know, crisps, then that's something which is going to be able to help you get better. And that's what's helped me. So the things that I have done have essentially been habits that I have formed that helped me. When I first went on to SSRIs this time, because I initially went on them about six years ago, and I've been on and off of them ever since, I was uh, initially self-harming and that's something that I stopped because I recognized eventually that whilst it was a coping strategy for me at one point in my life, it was no longer something I needed or something that was helpful to me. And indeed, it formed something of an addictive behavior pattern for me. And so I tried to stop that. And sometimes I engaged in other kinds of self-destructive behaviors, but it ultimately wasn't something that I replaced with anything near as harmful. In addition to that, I was waking up every 90 minutes during the night and I had horrendous insomnia because I was terrified of going to sleep because I knew that I would immediately wake up. And when I woke up in the morning, I couldn't get back to sleep because essentially I felt like I wasn't going to be able to get to sleep. Now that wasn't something that was intrinsic to me, but it was causing enormous amounts of problems with my mental health. It meant I was deeply depressed. I wasn't getting enough rest and that made me more depressed. And the solution wasn't essentially taking drugs. The solution was sleep hygiene. And that sleep hygiene consisted of putting up a decent kind of blackout blind for a while, wearing a fa an eye mask at night, uh, putting some earplugs in my ears, making sure that my room was quiet, and uh, putting my mobile phone somewhere where I couldn't reach it in the night. Because what I was doing was I would wake up every 90 minutes and then I'd check my phone and then I'd scroll through it. And then the light that was coming from my phone, no matter whether I had any kind of you know, screen protector on it or not, was entering my body and that was influencing whether my brain thought it was day or night. And consequently, it was making it way harder for me to get back to sleep. And when I was asleep, it was disrupting the natural rhythm of my body. Now, I know it's not in fashion for us to say, your mobile phone is ruining your life. But in this instance, it very much was because it was meaning that I couldn't sleep properly and that was making me more depressed. What else did I do? Well, I treated my symptoms. My partner recognized and I agreed that one of the biggest problems for me was getting out of bed in the morning because what would happen to me would be I'd go to bed pretty excited for the next day and then in the morning I'd wake up and I just wouldn't be able to get out of bed. I would cover myself with the sheets and I'd go back to sleep. And that was particularly hard for me because there was no reason for me to get out of bed. I'm a PhD student and most of the time I don't have anyone telling me you have to go and do this now. 
it's pretty much self-motivated. And that's one of the hardest things for postgraduate students. And so that meant that I had to be able to overcome that. Now, sometimes that entails putting deadlines on myself and making sure that if I don't get up, I'm disappointing someone. And I don't like disappointing anyone. I want everyone to like me, except really awful people. And so that made it easier for me to get out of bed on those days. Sometimes it meant having a flatmate, for example, who would essentially knock on my door uh, and tell me to get up. And if I didn't get up, they would come and basically tear the covers off me until I was awake and up and out. Or my partner would call me and we would have a conversation. She would essentially say, you need to get up now. And I'd be like, Mrr. and then she would say, no, you need to get up. And eventually I would, because I knew that the longer I kept her on the phone, the more angry she would get at me. And then the worse my day was likely to be because we were going to argue. And so that meant that I was essentially forming habits of getting out of bed, which was one of the primary symptoms for me of my depression. But here's the clever thing is the symptoms of your depression and the things that cause your depression are not isolated from one another. It's not that one thing causes another and it's just a discrete monodirectional relationship. It's co-constructive. So the more you find it hard to get out of bed, the more likely it is that feeds into thought patterns which essentially say you're not going to be able to get out of bed. And so the easier you find it to get out of bed and the more you actually take action which constitutes essentially an affront to your depression, the easier you're going to find it in future to continue doing those actions. It's essentially forming habits, which mean that your brain is never put in a position where depression is the default. And so the really important thing for me then was overcoming those kinds of habits. In addition to that, it meant forming quite rigorous and quite uh, regular work schedules and making sure that I got up, got out of the house, went to the gym, um, finished in the gym, went to the office, sat down in front of my desk. And even if it meant I had to watch YouTube for an hour, I would still be out of the house and I would still be out before, say, 11 a.m. when, if I was still in bed by then, I would feel awful, probably for the rest of the day. And that would mean then that I wasn't going to get anything done and that perpetuated the cycle of depression. So forming those habits was absolutely crucial to me in being able to overcome that problem in my life. And that's not to say that the drugs didn't help at all or that anyone else could do the same. Um, rather, it's to say that if you want to get better, there are changes you can make and you should try to make them. And you should get your friends and your family and your loved ones to help you to make those changes. Because ultimately, the medical profession will try and help you as best it can, but it only has a certain amount of tools and a certain amount of resources. Uh, the government's never going to help you. And unless you have a large amount of money to spend, it's unlikely you're going to be able to afford counselling or therapy in the long term. And it's unlikely you'll be able to get it through your university in the long term because most places will only give you, say, four to six sessions. And that's not enough time to sort everything out. So fundamentally, you do have to take responsibility for yourself. And you have to ask yourself the question whether you want to get better or whether you believe that that is never an option for you. Uh, and I think that for most people, the answer fundamentally has to be the former. And that's how you start yourself on the road towards forming the habits that help you to overcome the problems that constitute your mental health condition.